right, everybody, let's go. Fasten your seat belts. All right. Last chance, or you get a demerit. I think it might be on the back table or side table. All right, welcome to the ISFMP Policy Board. I'm Lewis Daniel. I'm chairing the board today. And in front of you, you should have an agenda as well as the proceedings from our February meeting. Um, allow me a little bit of flexibility with the agenda, and I do have three additional items for um, under other business would be a state declaration of interest, um, letter from the Spiny Dogfish Board, and a NOAA update on the recreational policy development. Is there any other business that I am unaware of that needs to be added to this agenda? If not, without objection, our, our agenda and our meet proceedings will stand approved. Thank you. Public comment. Um, don't see anybody rushing to the table, so we'll move on. And I'll turn it over to Tony to introduce our discusser on the Management and Science Committee report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, the board tasked the Management and Science Committee to look at climate change and then um, based on their findings of how climate change is affecting commission species to give us um, some guidance on allocation decisions and processes. So first we're going to have Dave Richardson from NOAA Fisheries here to talk about the science behind uh, climate change and then Mike Armstrong will go into the Management and Science Committee committee's um, recommendations on allocation decision-making processes. Right. My name is David Richardson. I'm from the Narragansett Lab of the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. And I'm going to be talking about shifts in the distribution of four species, black sea bass, scup, summer flounder, and winter flounder. You can um, and there's basically two questions we're addressing. What are the patterns of these distribution shifts in these species? And then the second is what factors are driving these distribution shifts? Um, so these are just some pretty simple maps of the distribution of summer flounder during the fall for two different time periods. The first is 1980 to 1989. The second is 2000 to 2008. And what you can see in these maps is a pretty clear northward shift and distribution. Um, what you see is the highest abundance now is in the 2000 and 2008 period is in that Long Island to Massachusetts range, whereas prior to that is more the um, New Jersey to Long Island range. Um, then if you also look at the scale of the biomass on the trawl survey, you see a real substantial increase in the biomass. Um, so we have two things going on, a general northward shift and then an increase in biomass for this particular species. You can move on. So what we sought to do was to quantify distribution shifts along the shelf. This follows on some work that's been done over the past five or six years, similar analyses. Um, as you can see in the figure, we broke the coast up into um, a long shelf distance because it does curve. And so you have, looks like a uh, kilometer 200 is somewhere around Chesapeake Bay, um, and Rhode Island is somewhere around kilometer 700. Um, all the analyses we're going to show are from the Northeast Fishery Science Center trawl survey data. Uh, we did include the inshore strata. Um, so we go to about, let's see, I think about 20 meters. And the analyses are from 1972 to 2008 because there was a ship change from 2008 to 2009. So these are, you can go, these are just the reported long shelf center of biomasses for each species during both the spring and the fall. So the top panel is spring and fall summer flounder. Um, you can see I've outlined the one in red in the fall. It's a statistically significant shift in distribution of about 250 kilometers in the long shelf distance that summer flounder were found. In the spring, you do see a lot of bouncing around from the early 90s to the late or 2008. There was a pretty substantial shift as well, but the long-term trend is as noticeable. 
Um, the second set of panels are window flounder, or winter flounder. There is not really a noticeable shift, shift in winter flounder. Um, this is just the southern New England mid-Atlantic bite stock of winter flounder. Uh, for black sea bass, in the spring you see a significant shift northward as well. Again, it's in that 200 to 250 kilometer range. In the fall, during the early period, the population that was sampled on the trawl survey was actually pretty far north, dropped down south again, and then in recent years, in the fall, black sea bass has been found further north in the trawl survey. Scup in the spring also, you see that northward shift, and in the fall, it's um, much less clear what's going on. The, Long shelf center of biomass bounces around, but there's not as clear of a shift northward. Okay. So the question is, we, we're seeing these patterns, they've been reported before. Um, what factors are driving these? Uh, the first question is, is it because of increasing temperatures? Is this due to climate change? Or are there other factors? Changes in population abundance is one factor that could be driving them. And there's, generally thought that populations that increase or are large tend to occupy a larger area and also will tend to shift their distribution. Or is it changes in population, population size structure? Uh, for a lot of these species, we see larger ind individuals at the northern end of the range and smaller individuals at the southern end of the range. So as you change fishing pressure, you're changing the ratio of larger individuals to smaller individuals. And you can actually induce a shift in the population just by changing the intensity of fishing on the population. So that was the goal of the analyses. I'm just going to show some uh, quick slides on some of the patterns we've seen. These are temperature patterns uh, through time, the same time period. You can see that general increasing temperature in both the spring and the fall. Um, move on. Uh, population abundance, most people are pretty familiar with the trends in a lot of these populations. This is just a recent summer flounder uh, stock assessment as an example, where you can see the real low biomass that the population was at in the late 80s, early 90s, and then a real substantial recovery and leveling out um, in the recent period. So a real increase in biomass for summer flounder. Move on. And then this is just a series of maps showing the distribution of summer flounder uh, in different size classes. So illustrating that point that larger fish tend to be found further north. So if you look in that 20 to 29 centimeter size class, you see most of the fish are in the fall are very much in the southern end of the range. You don't really even see many north of New Jersey. If you go to the 40 to 49 centimeter size class, it's mainly in New Jersey through uh, Massachusetts, and then that largest size class, the 60 to 69 centimeter. You really don't see many fish south of Hudson Canyon in that largest size class. So this follows the basic pattern we see in a lot of species where the larger fish are not necessarily completely overlapping the smaller fish, and larger fish tend to be further north. As I mentioned before, your proportion of large fish in a population is directly to tied to the fishing pressure on that population. So this is just another way of looking at that same pattern. It just shows the long shelf range of different size classes of summer flounder from the small size class in the green. They tend to be at kilometer 200. Um, up to the larger size classes, which tend to have the center of their range somewhere in the Long Island through Rhode Island range. Um, and again, going on to the uh, proportion of size classes constituting the total abundance, that's what this plot is for those different size classes. As I mentioned before, for summer flounder, the early 90s, uh, late 80s was a period when the stock biomass was at the lowest level. Um, the size composition of the stock was very truncated at that time. As fishing pressure was reduced, the population recovered, and the size structure of the population increased, such that through most of the 2000s, you've had a lot of big fish in the population um, that you didn't see early in the time period. Uh, some of the other species, just 
quickly, black sea bass, I know these may be hard to make out. In the spring, you see a little less size structure in the distribution, but in the fall, you do see that general pattern where larger fish are further north in the fall. And you do, it's not as distinct as for summer flounder, the change in the size structure of the population. Uh, for scup, uh, in the spring, a similar pattern. Larger fish tend to be further north in the spring than smaller fish. In the fall, the trawl survey may not do as well of, or as good of a job sampling scuff. I think it catches a lot of smaller fish, and it tends to only catch the smaller fish at the northern end of the range. We think that may be in part due to the fish moving out into the um, range of the trawl survey as it's passing in the northern part of the range, but not in the southern part. But again, you can see the larger size classes do tend to be further north in the fall for scup. And so this just brings me to the analyses. I'm just going to touch on this quickly. We did some statistical analyses to look at what factors we think are actually driving the shifts in the distribution for each of these species during each of these seasons. And um, there's three different um, terms that we tested. The first is temperature, second is size structure of the population, and the third is abundance. Um, these were GAM models. I, the details are in the working paper. I'll just give you the main results here. What you see in black is what we found to be the significant terms in terms of what is affecting the distribution, the, the northward extent of each of these populations. So winter flounder, um, in the fall the only, there was a significant temperature term, but for winter flounder, again, we didn't see much of a distribution shift. For summer flounder, what the analyses suggest is that the mean length of the population is really the dominant factor that's underlying that shift northward in summer flounder. Uh, for scup in the spring and black sea bass in the spring, though, it seems like temperature is what's driving the population northward. And the scup in the fall and black sea bass in the fall were not now analyzed. We didn't feel um, as confident that the trawl survey on its own was capturing the population as well as it should be. Um, feeling is that there are a lot of fish inshore of the trawl survey for both the, the species during the fall. So we did focus on the spring. So just to conclude, um, distribution shifts and the impacts of climate change can be complicated. This is not just a simple story that waters are warming, fish are moving north. There's other factors at play. But the patterns are pretty evident. You're seeing that northward shift in black sea bass, scup, and summer flounder. Um, our analysis suggests that for black sea bass and scup, temperature is a very important factor. But for summer flounder, what's really overwhelming the analyses is that recovery of the population and the increase in size structure. And for the winter flounder stock, we're not seeing a shift. So the main points of this is that fishing pressure and climate change are interacting to drive abundance and uh, distribution. It's in some cases hard to partition out each of those factors. And that'd be it if anybody has questions. Yes. Thank you, Dave. Questions for Dave, Tom? Yeah, I was looking at the winter flounder and I, I noticed the other three species the stock size has grown, where winter flounder has actually stayed the same and gone down. And did you pick that species because that was one of the ones not following the trend of the other three? Um, you know, I actually was not part of the species selection. I don't know if we were asked to do winter flounder or if that was, okay. That was, I think, chosen by the person who did this analysis. He had done some other work, that, interesting work on winter flounder, showing that changes in the abundance of winter flounder seem to actually be tied to temperature. You, the stock recruitment curve has a strong, um, the strong effect of temperature on recruitment in winter flounder, but they don't seem to be shifting distribution as much in response to temperature. So this, actually this study that Rich did on distribution is a companion to some other work he's done on shifts in recruitment with uh, climate change and with temperature. So I think that's actually why the winter flounder made it into this analysis. Thank you, Dave. Any other questions for Dave? If, if not, we'll move into Michael. Continue. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, as you recall, a little over a year ago, this board charged the Management and Science Committee with investigating the, the potential change for distribution of species uh, with a couple of different charges. One was to find the species that we should investigate further. Um, and we looked into that, and we uh, ended up with summer flounder, black sea bass, and scup. And those are species that are quota managed by state by state quotas and seem to be in the mid Atlantic where a lot of the changes are going on. Um, also, summarize the state of the knowledge of, of the species change. Um, and there are now dozens of papers that illustrate species changing in response to warming temperatures and such, but none concentrate on these species. So uh, we've been working with David and his cohorts and uh, coming out with all this data now, which is, which is really compelling stuff. Um, and then, based on um, this information that suggests, yes, these things really are occurring, um, define methods we could possibly use by, to adjust the state by state quotas or other things we could possibly do. And so what we decided as an MSC was to survey you folks to see what you would find palatable under different scenarios. I guess with the assumption that there may be some that are so unpalatable, why move forward with them? So we came up with ideas talking to you folks talking to industry, talking among the panel, and we came up with a number of them. And let me show you the results of the survey. Uh, the responses were pretty good. Um, with 22 responses, one from every state, respond to the survey. The first was status quo, and 56% would not support that. And I'll, I'm going to go through these very quickly if you have questions at the end. Um, what you'll see coming up again and again is neutral, a fair amount of neutral. And based on some of the comments, we feel that that is generally because people didn't have enough information. They read the, 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 you know, the scheme and said, well, I don't know what species it belongs to. I don't know exactly how you'd implement it, so I'm going to say I'm neutral on it. And so we have a lot of neutrals. So status quo is basically most people did not think that's where we should stay. Um, most feel that the uh, species, some of them, are shifting, and now we have uh, the papers coming out that confirms all this. Um, but also many people said, like I just said, we need more specific information um, to, to evaluate all these schemes a little bit better, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> so the first group of three options we call the cause and effect scenario, and the first one um, if an area has seen an increase in abundance of biomass um, since the historic allocation, then that area would get a bump up based on that. Now, again, what number you use to to um, indicate the increase? Is it the straw survey? Is it catch per unit effort of landings? That's not worked out. But that was one allocate. The next one is. We allocate based on the historic allocation during the base period for that species. Some number, we give the example here, 50%. That 50% could be 70, could be 90. The remainder we allocate in some scheme based on giving more to, uh, of, from that allocation to the states where it's evident that the abundance has increased. Um, and then the last option was allocated based on states' recent fisheries performance on some parameters of catch rates, regulations, uh, things like that. Uh, the results of that were um, the favorite was scenario B, which is we take the base period, we, we allocate it 50 percent, 90 percent, 75 percent, and look at some remainder of allocating to the states that it's clear where the, the evidence, and again, what parameter we're going to use to measure that is unclear. We allocate a, a further amount to different other states. Um, some of the options, option A was generally unpopular um, because there doesn't seem to be enough data to support that sort of specificity. Um, option B was preferred. It seemed to strike a balance, a reasonable approach where you maintain the historic allocation and then some piece we, we redistribute. And option C was viewed as practical, but not sure 
how we could actually do it. Now, again, keeping in mind, this was we put it out as for commercial and rec, and as you think through your head, the the ways we'd implement it would be completely different between the two fisheries. Uh, the next one was a flexible landings option. Whoops, where did I go? Oh. So you're missing that. Yes. The flexible landing options were fishermen harvest, and keep in mind this could be commercial or recreational. Fishermen harvest in waters where the fish are, and those landings count towards the state quota the fishermen are licensed in. That was something industry had put forward. Um, the other one is fishermen harvest in the waters where the fish are, and those landings count towards the state quota the fishermen land the fish in. Now that's that's pretty much status quo for much of commercial, but very different for recreational. The results were pretty much everyone hated option A, where you um, land fish in a state, but they count towards the quota of the state you're licensed in. That was not favored. The other one had had good support. All right, we can go on. The next option was establish a baseline of abundance where the stock is considered recovered. This would be based on, like, striped bass in 95, it was declared recovered. So the remaining stock growth after that would be reallocated based on some scheme. This is similar to the 50-50 allocation, the base historic allocation, but it would be based on the stock assessment in a period where we did, uh, say it was restored. 68% uh, very good support on that. Many responses thought this was a good approach to consider. Uh, people favor the fact that it keeps a historic reference but allows for expansion of the stock. Um, we need to be cautious because some of these are only short-lived surplus. Okay. And then uh, there was the option of establish a coastwide quota for part of the year in state by state allocations for other parts, like we do it for the SCUP commercial. Uh, mixed support, that was one where most people <laughs> were neutral, meaning to, to me that means you didn't have enough information which species and how you would implement that. <laughs> I'll go back. And then, of course, the option of just do away with state by state allocations. Um, most people um, were negative towards this option. States like to manage at the state level, and most people wanted to re remain that way. So, and those, so those were the scenarios. And again, there may be others too, um, but given possible future stock shifts, um, how frequently should we reallocate? If we go down the road of reallocating, how frequently should we do it? Uh, the majority thought five years. Every five years was a reasonable approach with a number of people also preferring three years. So in the short term rather than the long term was the opinion of most of the people um, who responded to the survey. All right, we can skip that. So the, the summary of the different options, we then asked, uh-oh, that's a good one too. <laughs> uh, let me wave my arms. So the next graphic showed we asked you which reallocation options of all the ones we just talked about would you support for the individual species of black sea bass, summer flounder, and scup. The results indicate that the cause-effect scenario B, which is allocate portion by the base and then reallocate another portion based on the most recent uh, abundance indices, some indicator. That was the favorite for all species. The second favorite was um, option four, which is the, what we term the surplus production. Um, which is establish a baseline where the stock is considered recovered and above and beyond that is reallocated based on a measure of the shifting abundance. 
So those are the those are the two preferred options. Looking at the surf, surplus distribution, which is the stock is recared, declared recovered, and we reallocate above and beyond that. It's based on stock status. The cons is it will not address issues with a stock that is expanding. Uh, that is, is expanding but not increasing in abundance, where it's simply redistribution in terms of temperature, but we haven't had a great increase in abundance. Um, it could be based on a boom and bust scenario. If stocks experience a boom, states receive a surplus. When things come back down, those states will lose that surplus. And in some cases, they could still have those fish in their waters because they redistributed by temperature, but we're regulating on abundance. So we could have that sort of thing going on. For the historic current combination, it's not tied to the stock assessment. It's flexible. Um, it'll address changes, um, expansions in the range. The, uh, the con is we, if we are real allocating, we need long data sets that are up to date. And we need to figure out how to switch from the Bigelow into the new NEMAP surveys and all that. Um, this was the, the historic current combination is, was the preferred option of the Management and Science Committee. So it was one of the preferred options of you folks, and this is the one we selected would probably be the best to implement. So these are the, I'll let you read these, these are the basic ideas how to start thinking about this. It's, there may be other options in certainly com combining things, doing one for the rec, one for the commercial. Um, all right, I think we can skip that. Let's go to, the, the big thing is robust data sets are critical for making all of these. We as a management science committee do not have the data. Dave and his cohorts managed to to do all what they did um, from a scientific point of view. It, we're now at the point it needs to be implemented for species. The management and science, we can't do that. Um, but we think we're at the point where we should start coming up with examples, um, hard examples, so you can look at them. It's very hard to think about this in a diffuse theoretical concept um, without starting to pull out examples. How we do that, Interesting. Next yeah. um, we think this needs to be kicked down to the TC committees at this point. So this board needs to decide, do we move forward th with this? Do we have an overarching um, universal policy that all boards should be thinking about? And it's clear we might not need them for all boards right now. I mean, it's clear to me that probably black sea bass, the evidence suggests very strongly that temperature is the driver and they have clearly reallocated. Um, but um, we need to kick them down to the TCs and let them start uh, see what they can pull together for real data. And I can't see this screen, but... <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> So I think uh, you can read it, because I can't, because it's not here. Um, but that's our recommendation, is we're at the point now, we think the, there's enough evidence to suggest it's all happening. Your decision is how you want to apply it, how you want to get the boards to do it, and which boards you want to charge the TCs, because we think we're at the point where the TCs have to start bringing you real examples, and everyone can see how palatable it is and what the reality is when you start reallocating. And I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> Questions for Mike? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm trying to reconcile Dave's presentation and Mike's. Dave seemed to be, was not seemed, it was quite apparent that it spoke to the specificity with regard to shifts in uh, three species, three of the four that were examined. And, and Mike, your presentation was much more generic, it seemed. It didn't seem to relate solely to the species that we have good information on now that might warrant follow-up. So can you just speak to whether you're suggesting that, for example, TCs look across the board at species, and if so, do we have enough of a basis to look at those, or are we really only focusing on scup, black sea bass, and summer flounder at this point, or should we be? Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, that's a 
<laughs> that's a difficult question. Um, I would say it's up to this board two choices. One is come up with an allocation scheme that you would pass down to all the boards and say, if there's evidence to suggest the species you're working on is doing some sort of range shift, use this allocation. The policy board believes this is the best one. The other option is to specifically assign certain boards. Um, we didn't explore other species, but what we hear is, well, these are the ones that are quota managed on state-by-state -state basis. So right now, other species are moving, but it's fairly irrelevant to the management because we manage on a broad scale. Uh, does that answer your question? I, th I think the decision is really yours. From my point of view, it's the, the Black Sea Bass uh, Scuff Fluke Board. You probably want to charge, have them charge their TC. But the question is, it's clear black sea bass is redistributing by temperature, but fluke is redistributing because the stock is recovered. So philosophically, do you redistribute for one because it's uh, temperature and not the other because it's simply a success story? Jim? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had a question and a comment, and, and Mike, I was, you just it was like, made the comment, I said, I think we'd probably start um, with the summer on our scup black sea bass board because, and you know, we, as a, you know, obviously those are the ones that are changing, so if we're going to look at different options, that would probably be a good way to start. And considering we have no idea what's going to happen with regional management, we should probably start doing that sooner than later, so when we get to the fall again, we uh, have some more options. Um, but the question I had was um, just on that 50-50 approach would seem to have good support and if I got it right so it was 50 percent would be based upon the historic allocation and then the 50 percent would be based upon biomass um, but the biomass I guess I don't know how you get at that 50 percent because that's the allocation based upon historic stuff was done state by state and the biomass is more spread out, say, from, you know, if you got a larger part of the biomass from Jersey to, say, Massachusetts, so how would you dice that up since you don't have state-by-state -state biomass? My thoughts on that is throw it to the TC. But, um, so under that, and again, 50-50 was, that we just pulled that out of the air. might be 70-30. But under this 50-50, say, so we take the quota, 50% we allocate, everyone's state proportions that they've always gotten. The rest of the 50, through some mechanism we des designate, 80% is now north of New Jersey, 20% south. So that remaining 50%, we take 80% of that and distribute it to the northern states, and only 20. So th there will be winners and losers under all these scenarios. Thank you. Mike, um, the recommendations of management and science committee are, are not per se in our briefing report like you just presented them. And, and I, for one, am having trouble reading them. You say they're before you. Go ahead and read them. Can you help us out and tell us what they say? Thank you. Uh, which... Yeah, I can read. I got that one. Um, yeah, some of these, they're not really recommend. The recommendation, I guess, the, the true recommendation is we think the historic current allocation, the 50-50 straw man, is the simplest. Um, it's, it maintains some historic perspective and doesn't rely on stock status. So we preferred that. That's the recommendation. These ones here, we list caveats and things that we need to think about. And uh, do you want me to read those? To, well, these are basic ideas on how to start thinking about reallocating catches. Based on the survey, there's interest among the states in looking further at options. In-depth work will need be needed to establish specific reallocation schemes and determine the most appropriate data sets to use. The 50-50 in the historic current combination, current 
historic combination option is adjustable, not a final recommendation, and the percentages should be species specific. And historical allocations are accomplished using the available landings information, and landings are in weight. Generally, commercial landings are given in terms of gutted pounds, and recreational landings are usually in whole pounds. When considering reallocation options, it would be useful to work in either gutted or whole weight with agreed upon conversion factors. So they're mostly just data caveats at this point. <clears throat> Richie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think the, the recommendation of the uh, Summer Flounder SCUP Sea Bass Board is, is a great place to start because you, you certainly have the, the two different scenarios um, uh, to deal with. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> you have two, two new states on the Black Sea Bass Board, and um, I mean, I'm getting calls from commercial fishermen saying, hey, when are we going to have a shot at these? And you know, clearly we're, and, and uh, Pat said Maine has experienced the same thing, so we're going to have to, these are issues that we're going to have to deal with, so uh, I, I think that would be a great place to start and have the technical committee uh, for those species start to, you know, work on this and see what they can come up with. Thank you, Richie. Tom? Yeah, I, I can see black sea bass more evident on this because of its temperature change. But what I see, and if I'm looking at this right, the numbers of fish in the south might be greater than they are in the north, except the bigger fish are in the north, so that when it comes to the biomass. So do we want to make a decision that, you know, Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland become the nursery area to supply the, the north with big fish? And that's what I look at the reallocation there. It's a difficult decision to make. It's a lot more complicated than black sea bass. Because if we had a smaller fish in the south, their catch would go up dramatically because that's where the small fish are available. And in greater numbers than the big fish up north, if I'm looking at this right. Uh, or the same amount of numbers because there's a lot of small fish down there. So that makes it a little more difficult than, say, black sea bass. And one of the things we proposed, I guess, about 15 years ago, because we thought... By this time, we'd be 40 million pounds of the summer flounder quota that we basically would take those increases in the summer flounder quota and basically use that to distribute it to the states where the abundances were showing up differently and not take it away from the states that historically had a catch. But because of uh, the way the SSC has been handling summer flounder, black sea bass, and, um, and scub, we have not been able to do that because even though they recover, we're still fishing as the overfish stocks. So it's, it really complicates the whole matter. To that point, one of the difficulties of the surplus uh, where we declare uh, a stock um, recovered is generally that's at BMSY, and there will be no further growth from BMSY. The intent is to stay at BMSY. So in some species, um, having declared it, there's nothing greater than that to reallocate. So that's why we preferred the arbitrary pick some percentage of the stock allocated historically, and then the growth above that reallocate. Follow up, Tom. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, but we made an arbitrary decision that, you know, we started out with 320 million pounds of spawning stock biomass on summer flounder and reduced it down. But we also, from the last stock assessment, says that summer flounder recruitment is not based on spawning stock biomass. Matter of fact, some of the years you've had the greatest spawning stock biomass, the recruitment has been worse. So there, you know, so we are, how are we managing that for the good of the stock or for the availability of the stock? And that's, that's where the problem arises. All right, I got uh, Dave Simpson. Thanks, and this probably is more a question for um, Dave. The, um, so all the work based on the federal trawl survey is, is great, and I would love to be able to do the same thing uh, further inshore, and I wonder your thoughts of, of being able to combine the various state trawl survey indices through some standardization method Z scores or something to see uh, how these patterns may play out over time near shore, which is more relevant to at least summer flounder recreational fisheries. Um, it's certainly something we've talked about. I don't know if we've agreed upon a way to combine all the different trawl surveys that may 
take place at different times of the year in some cases and certainly are using different gears. So it's something I think Rich has, who did the analyses, is certainly thinking about and is aware of. Um, but we haven't made progress on that currently. And then, you know, we've also done some analyses to try and quantify, you know, looking at these other trawl surveys, what proportion of the stock is inshore. And, you know, the biggest one that pops out is SCUP. A real high proportion of the stock is definitely inshore of our trawl survey if you just compare NEMAP catch rates to the uh, Bigelow catch rates. So we know that one, there's a real substantial issue in the fall. Um, so in the spring, it's obviously not much of an issue. Dave Borden. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think this is a very useful uh, exercise, and I agree with Jim Gilmore's uh, suggestion to start with uh, those three species. But I guess I would caution that I, I look at this more as an exercise at this point. I, don't, I, I think we need to follow up on, on Mike's suggestions and actually develop some realistic scenarios uh, using a couple of species. I think black sea bass would be a good candidate uh, species. And, uh, and, and the reason I say that, add that caution, is that I think there are a lot of other factors that are going to come, come into play uh, with any kind of reallocation decision. Just remind everybody that the that the industry has developed a whole series of fishing practices during the last 20 or 30 years that are based on, on these quota allocations. Significant portions of the Massachusetts, Rhode Island, northern New England fleet uh, have have uh, summer flounder licenses in, in uh, Virginia and, and spend significant amounts of time steaming up and down the coast uh, selling their product in, in another state. And the same thing with North Carolina fishermen uh, coming up north seasonally to participate in other other fisheries. And reallocating the quotas may be a good idea if you just look at it from a static perspective, but it's going to affect uh, particular individuals more than than uh, fish fishermen in general. So I think it's important to just be cautious about this. Uh, Paul Diodati. Uh Robert Boyles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mike, nice job. I know this was um, tough. Appreciate the uh, the work of the uh, the committee on this. Uh, just wanted to um, just offer a comment. You know, we spent a lot of time talking about allocation in my time on the South Atlantic Council. And uh, Mike, I just wanted to give credence to the idea of this. Um, 50% plus 50%, you know, this idea that, uh, you know, you look at historical averages and uh, where the South Atlantic Council ended up for a number of years was uh, look at a long-term average, and uh, those um, that constituted half of the allocation history. Um, but the other half of the allocation of the landings history was based on a more recent time frame, um, more recent um, analysis of where the catch was made. And this was primarily sector specific, not geographically specific. But uh, um, to the degree that any reallocation scheme, and I use that word deliberately, reallocation scheme um, was perceived as uh, being equitable. Um, that one seemed to get some um, traction in the South Atlantic Council. So I'd just like to offer you uh, my encouragement and uh, thanks um, for you guys looking at this very, very difficult issue. Thank you. A little, little summary time, I think. Um, but first, a couple of comments. Um, some of the things that strike me as being concerning in some regards is shifting the fishery and providing more allocation to the areas where the larger fish are and harvesting the larger fish. Is that a good idea? I don't know for the for stocks, bonding stock biomass, is that a, is that a good plan? Um, Dave Borden made my point um, in terms of shifting the allocation in a mobile commercial fleet. That, that raises some real serious red flags. I mean, there, there's in the recreational fishery, I can understand, and we need to look at the landings information to see if these shifts in distribution are affecting the landings from the recreational fishery. I mean, obviously, if the fish no longer occur in North Carolina waters, for example, then 
the recreational fishermen may not have any access to them and those fish could be redistributed to the areas where they are. But as you pointed out, Dave, North Carolina's vessels, Massachusetts vessels, Virginia's vessels travel up and down the beach and, and it doesn't matter where the fish are. They can still catch the fish. So as long as they can catch the fish and harvest the fish, well, why would you want to reallocate? So I think what I heard around the table and what I'd like to propose is that we we do start with, I'd like the boards, the individual species boards to come up with how to handle these as opposed to this board. Um, because I think there, there needs to be a lot of discussion at the Summer Flounder Black Sea Bass Cup Board if that's the first one we want to do. Looking at is the 50-50, is that a reasonable percentage? It, should it be different? Um, I think there's a lot of in, information that can be generated from an individual species board that we may not be able to generate here and then start looking at some of these issues and impacts. It does seem, you know, speaking obviously on, from a biased perspective, um, with summer flounder as an example, um, we've got great success. And we, I think I heard success story said three times. And now one of the, the dominant players in the fishery that has, that has contributed to that significant success could, could lose out as a result of the shift if it's the, if it's the age and size structure shift that we're talking about. So I think there's a lot there to think about. Um, I don't think anybody's rushing in to do something right away, but uh, is there any objection to this board asking the Black Sea Bass Cup um, Flounder Board to start begin to take a look at these allocation issues and the implications? Does that seem like a reasonable approach for Doug? Not an objection. You know, I think that's a good uh, first step in this, particularly in, in having them come up with a range of alternatives as far as um, uh, a reallocation uh, options here, uh, because 50-50 may look very different than 20-80 than or 80-20, and it'd be, I think it'd be very informative to the board and to this whole policy board uh, to see what that happen, or how that uh, shakes out. The, the other thing that I am going to ask my black sea bass uh, board members is, is that are the federal permits limited access? Because that also brings up an issue for particularly uh, Maine and New Hampshire that would be potentially new board members here. That you could have a quota reallocation but how many people in our state have a black sea bass permit? So we may not be able to do it. So that see, that's another uh, high-level uh, issue that maybe it's good to have the uh, the black sea bass cup and summer flounder board look at first. But I think we might want to have them report to us uh, how their um, uh, how things uh, how they work out these issues what the issues they're looking at, because it may be something that the policy board's going to want to be looking at on a, on a broader range of things, because a lot of these are, are, are federal permits, and there's a lot of different species where this, we may need to have to deal with this. And we may want to have some kind of, in the long run, some kind of general overarching policy on these things as to how to deal with this. So that's my only... Uh, suggestion is that the policy board still be kept appraised of everything that's going on. Without objection? That's how we'll proceed. Bob? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I support the recommendation. Uh, it's a good one. Just a quick procedural question. I, I think to Tony, can, I just need to be reminded, are state allocations the sole prerogative of the commission or is it a joint prerogative of the commission and the Mid-Atlantic Council? Bob, it depends on which species you are referencing. Summer flounder is a joint um, allocation. Black sea bass is solely by the state, and scup is solely by the state for the summer state quotas, but then the period allocations are jointly done through the council and the commission. Just a quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. So given that the MID is moving forward with their summer flounder FMP process, it seems very important to me, uh, FMP amendment process, it, it seems very important to me that we 
coordinate with them early and often on this issue. Thank you. And just as so the policy board knows, uh, both Kirby and I are on the FMAP for the council summer flounder um, amendment, and that at the joint meeting in August we would bring up whether or not the commission wants to initiate with the council on that amendment so we would have two concurrent amendments going at the same time and then um, we can get the board to give us direction for input to the FMAP. Anything else on this agenda topic? Yes, sir. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just want to, when this does go to the summer flint. Do you know what your name? I'm uh, Brandon Muffley. Thanks. Um, when the board does look at this, I think there are still some biological and science issues that the TC should still evaluate when they look at this, not just the 50-50 options, but I do think and you touched upon them, Chairman, and, and so did Dave, that I know when I was on management and science, when I was there, we started to look at this and we were looking at some of the other, we wanted to look at some of the other surveys and what they may be showing, not just relying this all on the NIMS bottom trawl survey. And as you, you know, uh, talked about the implications of shifting uh, the fisheries to these larger fish. So I think there are some biological considerations that the TC needs to evaluate, not just allocation scenarios when they do talk about this. Yeah, I would. that would be my hope that the board, the, the, the Flounder board would actually push this down to the technical committee for all those types of discussions and analyses. Last word, Tom. Yeah, on the black sea bass, I was looking at the northern, but we have a southern black sea bass population. And I'm wondering if that is showing the same temperature movement. So are they going to fill in the states that, I mean, is anybody looking at any work on that? I know it's a different management plan. There's been a lot of difficulty at the South Atlantic over how to manage black sea bass down there. But if we're looking at a temperature shift, are they starting to move north? So they're going to be taking from areas there to fill in areas above. Or are they a completely different species have a different temperature range? That would be information that could be gleaned from probably the MarMap survey, I would think. But I don't know that any of that work has been done. But we certainly would welcome any and all black sea bass from the South Atlantic to move to North Carolina. <laughs> Wishful thinking, right? All right. Good discussion. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move around a little bit on the agenda and turn it over to Tony to take care of a few of these other items um, that we can knock out here in about five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in February, I asked all of the states to look at the declaration of interests for the species boards and make changes. Um, and today we just need to, oh, I'm sorry, Kate, it's number eight. I apologize. Um, and make changes that to either add or remove states from the, the boards. And I'm just looking for a uh, agreement that these changes are being made today. Um, so for spiny dogfish, we removed, or Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina asked to be removed. Horseshoe crab to take New Hampshire off and add the Potomac River Fisheries Commission. Black sea bass is to add Maine. Lobster to remove Virginia and North Carolina. Um, and coastal sharks to remove New Hampshire. Are there any other changes that were not given to me that need to be done. Pat? Look like it's pretty clear. If there are not any other additions, would you need a motion, Mr. Chairman? Or we just can do Don't it? Don't need a motion, just an agreement that there's no, no others to add. So everybody's cool? Happy? Satisfied? Okay. You got another one you can do real quick? Um, and it, for those, for the cancer crab, if we initiate a cancer crab FMP, then we'll make those changes, just in case anybody's wondering about those. Um, and then secondly, the um, Spiny Dogfish Board asked for the policy board to consider writing a letter to NOAA Fisheries on the um, comments for Amendment 3. And Mark Gibson is our Spiny Dogfish Chair. Does that, do you want me to go, is that good, Mark? All right, so it's agreeing to um, do um, the changes in the um, allocation from seasonal to 
uh, periods, I, I believe. I'm doing this off of memory. And to have uh, RSA as well as to do um, the year-to-year rollover of specifications. And it would put our, their plan more in line with the commission's um, spiny dog fish plan. Do we need a motion? Concurrence is good. Do you concur, Pat? If I do, we're all set. Thank okay. You. Any objection to writing that letter? All right, that, that, that's good. We'll give ourselves a three-minute cushion. We caught up a little bit, but not much. We will come back at... So I think uh, where we are is the uh, legislators and governor's appointees have a lunch meeting in this room, and uh, lunch will be served for just the legislators and governor's appointees out in the hall. And the executive committee of ACCSP has a meeting in the boardroom down the hall, and lunch will be served for them, this buffet as well. Other commissioners have, a, have some time off to go grab lunch. Um, I think Dennis and I talked earlier, he's going to try to push through the LGA luncheon um, a little bit quicker in about one hour. So if uh, folks could come back around 1.15, we'll restart the policy board for a while, Lewis, and then you know see how far you want to take that. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, a number of folks have, have traveled in for the uh, MRIP workshop at, that's scheduled for 2 o'clock. So may not want to push that too far, but if you know, we'll just see how far we can go, push it to maybe 2.30 or something. And then uh, you know, if there's things that need to roll over to the policy board tomorrow, we can just, I guess, check where we are toward the end of that time. If that sounds okay with everybody. Everybody, everybody comfortable with that approach? All right, we'll see you after lunch.